Hello, this is David Scher. I'm back again for another uh, lecture in Physics 572, Introduction to Health Physics. It's enjoyed their first week and then their long weekend with the MLK holiday. Um, I'm ready to get to work. Uh, on with where we are. I believe we have some homework that's going to be coming in tomorrow on Thursday. Uh, and I'm looking forward to seeing how you all do. And that's going to be an indicator of how I'm doing, how well I'm patient to you all. Um, now we're going to uh, move on to our uh, slides and talk today about uh, how photons interact with matter. So last time, last week, we talked about uh, radioactivity and radiation. So what we found out is that when uh, a stable nucleus undergoes a decay, it can give off energy in the form of radiation. Sometimes the decay uh, uh, will take a, the, the this, the old nucleus will come to a, a new nucleus with a new co co collection of neutrons and protons, but sometimes it's in an excited state. And so when there are transitions to move to a more stable state, the, the way that excess energy is emitted from the nucleus is as a photon. Uh, when it comes to the nucleus, it's called a gamma ray. And uh, these gamma rays have very specific energies, as you can see on this chart. They don't have a wide range of, of all possible energies. Whatever the transition is, that's what the energy of the photon is. Likewise, we talked about atomic processes. There are shells in the nucleus, excuse me, in the, in the electron cloud around the nucleus. And electrons can take different energy energies in, uh, characteristic of those shells. And when they transition from a more loosely bound to a more tightly bound shell. They have excess energy. And in order to accomplish this transition, they give up that excess energy as a photon, typically. Other possible ways we talked about. But this is a, a place that we get photons uh, from. And the energy of the photon is equal to the difference in the energies of the two shells. And a third process that's an atomic process is not from the nucleus itself is uh, when high energy electrons are incident on a material, they can be decelerated by the, the nucleus electrical forces between the negative electron and, uh, and they slow down in this way, they have to give up their extra en excess energy somehow, and they do that as a, a photon of light. When, fo uh, uh, when photons come from these atomic processes, we call them X-rays instead of gamma rays. Okay. Um, as I said a little bit ago, when there are specific uh, energy shells, the transitions between them give rise to photons with very specific energies. We talked before about some data sources where you can see what those radiation energies are, uh, the chart of the nuclides, and uh, the HPS and decay data <coughs> website were some that I displayed. And Bremsstrahlung, that third process, uh, gives us a, a wide variety of energies, not a single energy. And we're going to talk more about this in the coming week. Next week, we're going to talk about how charged particles interact with matter. Bremsstrahlung is the result of a charged particle, an electron interacting with matter. So we're going to, we're getting a head start on it because now we're talking about it as a source of, of photons, of x-rays. Next time we'll talk about it as a way that uh, electrons give up energy in matter. Okay. Um, but anyway, these are the sources for, for photons, either gamma rays from the nucleus or x-rays from the atom. Um, now, where, what is the nature of, of uh, photons? What is the nature of, of X-rays and, excuse me, X-rays and gamma rays are just high energy versions of light 
just like the optical light that we, uh, we see with. Uh, microwave uh, and radio frequency light uh, is, is also of the same character. So it's been known for some time, since the middle of the 1800s, that light is a com that when there is a time varying magnetic field, that this can create an electrical field. That's how electrical generators work. You uh, turn a magnet inside a, a wire with uh, electrons, it creates an electric field, and, and the, the electric. It's also been known that a time varying electric field gives rise to a magnetic field. This is how you create an electromagnet or a solenoid. If there's a time varying uh, electric field, it produces the magnetic field, time varying magnetic field, it produces electrical field. So it is possible, and it was uh, explained by James Clerk Maxwell, that you can have, that, that there is, is possible to create a situation where a time varying electric field is creating a magnetic field, and that magnetic field is creating an electric field, and you have a self-sustaining system. This is electromagnetic radiation, and uh, X-rays and gamma rays are a very high-frequency version of uh, electromagnetic radiation. Okay. Um, typically, when you think about waves, like mechanical waves or sound waves or other waves, uh, the ripples on a pond, the amount of energy that's carried by those waves is related to how big the waves are how tall the, the um, uh, waves on the ocean are. That's how it's related to the energy that it carries. Or how, how loud, the, how, how much the, the air waves move. To, so the, the sound waves, uh, it's the, the intensity is, 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 uh, gives rise to the energy. Um, and low frequency waves can have low energy high frequency waves can have low energy it's the amplitude of the waves that determines the energy it turns out that we learned an interesting thing about a hundred years ago and that is that for light waves this isn't the case for light waves the energy carried by the, the wave is related to the frequency of the wave and also that the light isn't continuous wave that goes on forever, as this uh, uh, illustration might depict. It's actually quantized or bundled into packets, each with a certain amount of energy that's related to the frequency of the, the wave. H is a constant, it's a fundamental constant we talked about last time. Okay, so the photoelectric effect is one of the ways this was uh, proven. It turns out that it's been observed that if you shine light on certain metals that, that cause electrical charges, electrons inside the metal to be emitted, and you can uh, apply an electric field and collect those electrons. Uh, this process, this photoelectric effect, photo, photo meaning light, creating electrons, photoelectric effect, is how we do many things. It's how electric eyes work. It's how light meters work. It's how photocopying works. Um, and so um, uh, we know it occurs, and, and it has some interesting properties. It turns out that if you take long wavelength, low frequency light, red light is long wavelength and low frequency. And if you shine that on a particular material, it won't um, emit uh, the electrons. You can have the brightest red light possible and it won't emit electrons. So it's the energy to emit electrons is not related to the intensity of the light, it's related to the color or the frequency of the light. If you shine uh, a, a green light, which has a higher frequency, a shorter wavelength, all of a sudden some electrons are just barely emitted from the, the surface of the metal. If you have higher frequency light, blue is higher frequency, shorter wavelength, then uh, it's not how intense it is, it's the color of the light that will cause electrons to be emitted with higher energy, higher kinetic energy. 
So um, this photoelectric effect helped us to understand this thing I told you before about intensity, not excuse me, energy, not being related to intensity, but instead being related to frequency. Okay, um, so with low frequency light, no electrons are emitted. When intermediate frequency light is, is shining down the material, electrons just barely begin to uh, be emitted. And with higher frequency light, electrons are not only emitted, but they have kinetic energy as well. So um, at the threshold for electrons being released, the energy associated with that frequency of light exactly matches the energy that's binding the electrons into the material, the binding energy. Um, in the case of the photoelectric effect, we call this binding energy the work function. Um, uh, work functions for most materials are typically three to five electron volts, depending on what the material is. So not a ton of energy, very low energy. So optical light will often cause the photoelectric effect to take place. When we move to higher frequency light, that's H nu, nu is frequ the frequency, it's a Greek letter nu, it looks like a V, um, but it's not. Um, as we move to higher frequency, the kinetic energy carried by the electrons is equal to the H nu, the energy in the light, minus that work function, the squiggly phi, the Greek letter. So this is the relationship between uh, the uh, oh, that des describes the photoelectric effect and the energy that's imparted to the electrons. So this occurs with x-rays as well, not just optical light, the three to five uh, electron volts we're talking about. Uh, in the case of uh, x-rays and gamma rays, this absorption occurs most when the energy of the photon matches the energy in one of the shells. Uh, and you'll see that in the graph in, a, in just a moment. Um, and when it's, the energy is not close to the shell energies, the difference in shells, then it's less likely to occur. And here's a graph showing, um, illustrating the cross-section. The, the graph here is um, proportional to the cross-section, and you can see that when the light, uh, as the energy of the light increases, the likelihood that it will occur, the cross-section is a measure of how likely the, it is for this interaction to take place. So the, the probability decreases as energy increases. This is a logarithmic, logarithmic plot. Each of these divisions is a, a factor of 10. So this is 1, 10, 100, et cetera. This is uh, 0 0.1, 1, 10, 100, 1,000. Um, as we look on the other axis, so the slope of a log log plot is the power. So if we measure the slope, we'd find out this is a slope of uh, minus 3.5. So the energy falls off as about the energy of e to the 3.5, the energy of the incident photon. Also, it's been observed that the atomic number of the material is important. This goes up as the atomic number of the material to the fourth. Okay. Um, notice there's an absorption edge. There's a discontinuity in this plot, and I want to explain what that is. So um, this is equal to the binding energy of the K shell. When the photons have less energy, than the binding energy of the K shell, only the outer shells can be ionized. So uh, 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 electrons can be pr promoted from the L shell, from the M shell, etc. But all of a sudden, when, when the energy of an, uh, another source is above the, the, the threshold for the K shell, the binding energy of the K shell, all of a sudden the K shell electrons can be ejected too. And so the probability that the photoelectric effect will, will happen increases because all of a sudden a bunch more electrons can be promoted out of the, uh, can be uh, kicked out of the, the atom. And so these discontinuities are the edges that correspond to the binding energy of each shell. Um, that's one way in which uh, photons interact with matter, the electric effect. 
um, and we'll look more at that as we go along. Another way that uh, photons interact with matter is something called the Compton effect, discovered by Arthur Holly Compton at the University of Chicago. Um, he went to Washington U, became the president of Washington University in St. Louis. Um, so in the Compton effect, instead of the photons being absorbed by an electron and the electron taking all of its energy as kinetic energy, remember our that the kinetic energy took all of the photon energy minus the binding energy and it all became kinetic energy. So in the photoelectric and the uh, Compton effect, uh, some of the electron, some of the photon's energy is transferred to the electron and some of it goes on as a new photon with lower energy, lower frequency, longer wavelength. This is called inelastic scattering because some of the energy is transferred uh, from the photon to the electron. It's not that the, the photon that leaves has the same energy as it when it came in, which would be elastic scattering. Some of the energy is absorbed by this electron. There's a relationship between the angles involved, and this relationship for the is comes about because the total energy that's incident has to be equal to the total energy that's that, that leaves. So the incident, the energy of the incident photon, and the energy of the scattered photon plus the kinetic energy electron, all those have to add up to balance. In addition, there's another set of equations because the momentum has to add up. The momentum moving in the uh, direction from the incident photon before the interaction is h over lambda for the photon incoming. The, the uh, in, uh, momentum along the same direction has to add up. So the momentum of the photon and the momentum of the electron, we take the component that's in that direction, they have to add up to match. Then momentum upward for the photon, downward for the electron, those two have to exactly balance so that there's no moment, there was no lateral momentum in the beginning, there can't be any lateral momentum at the end. You will dis, uh, study this in great detail, or have studied this in great deal, detail, in Physics 571, where we talk about radiation physics. I'm not going to go through seen it. I'm just going to tell you the result, that uh, the energy of the scattered outgoing photon is related to the energy of the incoming uh, incident photon by this relationship, really, and it includes the scattering angle for, for the photon. Okay. So that's an important result that energy is transferred through this process. Energy that's transferred to the electron is equal to the incident energy, the energy in the incident photon minus the energy that's carried away by the scattered photon. That's how much energy is. In the medium, uh, in the electron. Okay, um, so the electron can be scattered at many different angles, right? It can take on any different angle. Um, it can be, uh, the, the scattering angle can be zero, so the, the, the photon basically misses the, the uh, incident electron or barely grazes the incident electron, transfers very little of its energy or none of its energy to the electron. So the, the um, outgoing photon and has all, uh, retains all the energy. The electron receives none of it. At 100 backward scattering, where the electron, the photon comes in, hits the direct uh, the the electron head on and bounces backward. That's when the maximum energy transfer occurs. And 180 degree angle. And then the electron carries uh, most more of the en energy than any other angle. This plot that's on this uh, uh, page is, or the slide shows an incident uh, uh, photon energy of 500 keV, which is pretty close to the rest mass of the electron. And so this shows it's typical; it's different for different uh, uh, photon energies, but this, but this characteristic that the 
energy that the um, greatest transfer of energy is 180 degrees uh, it remains the same so we're going to go back to the formula we used before and we're going to do an example suppose instead of a 500 keV photon we have a 1 eV photon and it undergoes scattering from an electron question is what's the energy of the scattered photon at 90 and 180 degrees so the energy of the incident photon, E gamma, is 1.00. The uh, m, mc squared is 0.511, that's mass of the electron. And for the cosine of 90 degrees, one of the angles I asked was about 90 degrees, the cosine of 90 degrees is zero. And so this formula becomes simple. It's 1 MeV over 1 plus 1 MeV divided by 0.51, so it's 0.388 about 0.34 MeV. How about our second question? What about 180 degrees? Well, the cosine of 180 degrees is minus one. That's gonna have the biggest denominator. Uh, and well, one divided by one plus one MeV divided by 0.511 MeV. And this is one minus a minus one. That's the same as one plus one, that's two. So we multiply the denominator by two, this portion, and it turns out this ratio is 0 0.204 MeV, 355, I think it was, 0 0.20355. Uh, but to our degree of accuracy, it's 0 0.204 MeV. Okay, now the next question, under the same situation, what is the energy imparted to the scattered electron? Well, we just calculated that the, uh, in, for 90 degree bend, the uh, scatter, the um, uh, scatter photon had an energy of 0.388 MeV. So the initial photon was one MeV minus 0.388 MeV is 0.612 MeV. That's how much energy is transferred to the electron. At the maximum scatter, uh, 180 degrees, um, this point, 388 becomes 0 0.204. Uh, that's what we had here, 0 0.204. Um, so the energy that's imparted to the electron is 0.796 MeV. So most of the electron, the photon, initial photon energy was transferred. Um, so uh, the cross section, as I mentioned before, is related to the probability that the interaction will occur. This is a differential cross-section for different angles. That's what this d sigma d omega means. And this is the formula that uh, describes the, the relationships. These lambda and lambda primes are the wavelengths of, of the incident and scattered photon. Uh, they're similar to the E and E prime we did before. RE is the um, uh, classical radius of the electron. It's this. It's just a number bunch of constants that get multiplied together, and theta is that scattering angle. The whole equation gets to be very long. It's the, these lambda operations, uh, are our ratios of the wavelengths, and it's similar to what we had, we learned before, that the ratio E prime over E is one over that same thing we saw before. Okay, so when we, uh, this describes at different angles what the different uh, probabilities that there will be a scatter occurs. So lots of that formula, the klein nishina formula. This is a polar plot. Let me see how we use this. What this tells me that is, uh, the way I would use this is at an angle of 30 degrees, I would go out this radius. That's how big the cross section would be at 30 degrees. At zero degrees, it would be this much. I would measure how far that is from the axis, from the, the origin. And that's how, how big the cross section would be at zero degrees. Um, and that, as I recall, is a 0.511 MeV. Uh, and so on our bottom chart, this is the same kind of information plotted a different way. This is the different angles from zero to 180 degrees. And this is the size of the cross-section, which would be the length 
the distance away from the origin uh, in this polar plot. And so 0.511 MeV is this blue one. So this plot here, uh, which is the, the red one, the, or sort of uh, magenta colored one, is 0.5 MeV. It's the same as the blue one. And you can see that it's very high in the forward direction. And if you look at this as it goes around the other directions, it's pretty constant. It's about almost a circle uh, as you, you look at different angles. So for different angles greater than 90 degrees or, you know, 75 degrees, from, it's, it's essentially a constant. It's like a, a circle. Um, and so the thing to notice about this is for relatively high energy phot photons, it's forward peaked. Everything except the very, very light, low energy photons, it's forward peaked. Most of the uh, photons scatter forward um, and impart less energy. Um, uh, for other angles other than forward, it's roughly constant in each case, low energy to high energy. And uh, the other thing to make note of that's not really in this plot is this is on a per electron basis. There are Z electrons uh, in, in uh, an atom. And so this cross-section increases linearly with the atomic number. Typical uh, 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 attenuation coefficient. It's essentially the, the, uh, showing us the cross-section. Um, shows us the probability of occurrence for different energies. So it's more likely to occur at low energies, intermediate range energies, and then tails off as higher energy at higher energies. The, the overall uh, graph becomes smaller at, at higher energy when you consider all different angles. Okay, um, that's the Compton effect and its likelihood at different energies. Uh, so there's a third way I've described uh, about how uh, photons give up their energy and matter, and that's called pair production. So we have heard, at least in the movies, that antimatter exists. It, it is true that it does exist, and it's identical to normal matter uh, in terms of its mass, in terms of all its character properties, except that it has the opposite electrical charge. With sufficient energy, it is possible to create a matter and antimatter pair. It has to be created in pairs so that all those properties, the, the mass number, the concert of the uh, electrical charge, all the different properties are conserved so that we have to create a pair, and a matter and antimatter pair. The minimum energy where you can do this, of course, is going to be you have to have enough energy to create the rest mass of this. Uh, matter antimatter pair. Um, so, for in the case of an electron, the antiparticle is called the positron. It's just like the electron with a positive charge, e plus e minus of the symbols. Each has a rest mass of 0.511 MeV. Each has a charge of one unit charge. And so, this interaction to produce the electron positron pair occur above a threshold equal to the total mass of both electrons, or 1.022 MeV. Um, any photon energy in addition to that will be shared between the electron and positron as connected. So uh, I don't think that there's any... Um, I have a, a diagram later that I will show you this. So the photon energy, photon is incident into this into an atom. Uh, it uh, creates a, a, pos an, a electron positron pair. If there's uh, extra energy besides the energy needed to create the, the pair, that that energy will um, show up as kinetic energy for the electron and positron, and they'll both be emitted from the the nucleus. Um, in practice, practical terms, it, it does, there has to be more energy than just the threshold. And, and this is only observed above about 2 MeV. Um, if an electron, well, let's talk about it on the next slide. 
So in addition to being created in pairs, anti and matter and antimatter can also annihilate each other as pairs. And so the, the reverse reaction, E plus plus E minus goes into uh, uh, photons is also possible. Now, if the rest mass, if, if the energy uh, of the photon that created the electron positron pair was very close to just the energy to create the pair, they would be very close to each other and they would annihilate each other. And, and then you just have the photons from the annihilation. You wouldn't have uh, the electrons and positrons moving out of the nuclear, the, out of the atom. Um, so the, the, uh, it, when an, an electron and positron are created and the positron has kinetic energy, the electron has kinetic energy, uh, positron is more likely to annihilate when it's very slow. It's, it's not likely to occur at high at, uh, speed as it's past other electrons. It has to give up its energy to uh, the, the electrons in the vicinity, slow down, and then when it's uh, moving slowly enough, essentially at rest, then it can combine with another electron and create uh, the radiation, the annihilation radiation. This is, when this occurs, there are two uh, photons that are each equal to the rest mass of the electron. That's shown on this slide. So here we have the incident photon coming in. Now, the interaction, we have the creation of the electron and positron. So all the momentum that's carried by this photon, well, some of the energy associated with that has to be given up to create the, the pair. So there won't be, it'll be hard to have a balance, it's impossible to have a balance of the, of the momentum and the energy. Uh, so the nucleus must be present to allow for the, uh, the momentum to be balanced along with the energy. Uh, the electron and positron are ejected, sharing the energy that was the excess energy beyond the energy created, the necessary to create it. Now the positron, as it slows down, eventually it will annihilate with an electron in the vicinity. And this will produce uh, two photons, each equal to the rest energy of these electrons, 0.511 MeV. Now, um, because the electron and the positron have slowed down to essentially at rest, there is no momentum in this, uh, no, at, at that point. And so the photons each have to carry the same momentum away in opposite directions so that the total momentum will be zero. And so one of the characteristics of annihilation radiation is that they have, that they, they're on collinear, they're on the same line, just back to back. Okay, so that's the, po this, but this pair production is a process whereby very large energy photons, can, high energy photons can deposit energy in matter. Okay. Um, the cross section, the probability it will occur, is a complicated formula. Uh, this R0 was the same R0 we had in the Klein Nishina formula, or R0, RE is a symbol there. It occurs again here, that's the classical radius of the electron. Um, Z is the atomic number, so notice that kappa is a symbol for cross section. Traditionally, it's used as a cross section for pair production. Tau is a symbol as the cross section for um, photoelectric effect. Sigma is used as a cross section for Compton scattering. Um, this P is where a lot of the complexity is. Here's a plot of P uh, at, related to the momentum carried by the photon, the, the positron, and different energy positron energies. And these are different energies of the incident photon. And these are different materials, aluminum and lead are different Zs. Okay, so that's got most of the complexity. The thing that's interesting to note is the uh, pair production increases as the atomic number squared. Okay, um, there's a thing called triplet production. I'm going to mention it because it's on my next graph. And I don't want you to be uh, wondering. At very, I remember I told you that the nucleus has to take up the momentum because there's an energy defect because of the rest mass electron positron that's produced. At extremely high energies, it's possible for that momentum to be taken up by another electron, a third electron, uh, instead of by an atomic nucleus. 
when it's done, uh, when, when this process occurs, there's an electron that's produced, there's a positron that's produced. There's also energy in that uh, orbital electron that took up all the extra momentum. And so three particles are emitted, uh, electron, positron, and the uh, orbital electron. And so this is called triplets, because what you see experimentally is uh, uh, three uh, electrons coming out, an E plus, an E minus, and another E minus. Uh, this is not very important in, in any situation I've encountered in radiation safety, but it is something that occurs. And so here's the, the um, graph showing that's proportional to the cross-section. There's the pair production in the nuclear field, typical pair production. This is the triple production or pair production electric field. It's at least a, a factor of 10 lower and more. Uh, so it's a small fraction of the other pair production. For most purpose, radiation safety purposes, we can ignore triplet production, but uh, it is, you see it on the graphs. So I didn't want you to not know what it is. The threshold for triplet production is higher. It has to be uh, 1.044, and in practice, you can see here, it's about, I don't know, 7, 5 M, uh, MeV before it, it shows up at all in this uh, graph. Uh, pair production, excuse me, uh, yeah, pair production can occur at 1.02 MeV, as I said. In practice, it shows up about 2 uh, MeV. Um, is a very small contribution below that. Now, putting all these pieces together, we have the attenuation that occurs because of photoelectric effect. We have uh, uh, photons that are removed because of Compton scattering. We have photons that are removed because of pair production. So this graph shows the attenuation from all these different processes adding up. Now it's a log, log plot. So notice that at very low energy, the uh, a uh, photoelectric effect may be a factor of a thousand, ten thousand, a million times greater than than the other interactions. In the intermediate range, the Compton scattering is greater than by maybe a factor of two, a thousand, maybe a factor of a hundred, five hundred, something like that. So, at intermediate range energies, the the Compton scattering is predominant, and at high energies photoelectric effect begins to take over. The others fall off as energy and photoelectric increases at high energy. So um, this is what we, I wanted to cover today. Uh, we'll continue with part 1b about using this uh, these materials. A little bit more about how we, we uh, relate the cross-section to the um, attenuation coefficient that we've seen. These, the, uh, how sigma and kappa, and how that relates to how uh, photons are removed. So we'll go into that, then we'll, we'll talk a little bit about data sources uh, for where you can find out these, these values for these different interactions, these coefficients, and, um, and uh, learn how to, to use this material in radiation safety. I thank you for your attention. I uh, uh, appreciate all that you, you know, the, the work you've done for with, uh, with me so far. I'm looking forward, as I said, to your uh, uh, homework to get a sense of how well, how, how well I'm doing, how well you're doing, and uh, uh, I look forward to hearing from you in the future.